Hello everyone and welcome to Internet Law Review. For today's story, we have the first Supreme Court decision of the term. Unexpectedly early, but it is here. It is Mount Lemon Fire District versus John Guido. This is a unanimous decision of the United States Supreme Court, eight to zero. Justice Kavanaugh did not sit on this de decision because this was held the first week of the Supreme Court term and he was not yet a justice. So this is an eight to zero decision and we're going to read what it has to tell us. Faced with a budget shortfall, Mount Lemon Fire District, a political subdivision in Arizona, laid off its two oldest full-time firefighters, John Guido and Dennis Rankin. Guido and Rankin sued the fire district, alleging their termination violated the Age Discrimination in Employment Act of 1967. The fire district sought dismissal of the suit on the ground that the district was too small to qualify as an employer within the meaning of the ADEA's compass. The act controlling definition provides... The term employer means a person engaged in industry affecting commerce who has 20 or more employees. The term also means, one, any agent of such a person, and two, a state or political subdivision of a state. The question presented, does the ADEA's numerosity specification, 20 or more employees, applicable to a person engaged in industry and commerce, affect as well to state entities, including political subdivisions, we hold in accord with the United States Court of Appeals for Ninth Circuit that Section 230's two-sentence delineation and expression also means, at the start of the second sentence, combines to establish a separate categories, persons engaged in industry affecting 20 or more employees and states or political subdivisions with no attendant numerosity limitation. 20 or more employees is confining language, but the confinement is tied to the first sentence and does not limit the ADA's governance of the employment practices of states and political subdivisions thereof. So let's return briefly to the statutory language now that we see what the Supreme Court's going to say and reread it as the Supreme Court does and see what they're talking about. So we see this section 630B, which I've highlighted in blue, has a provision that has a preamble. And the question is, does the preamble apply to the entire thing or only part of the thing? So let's read it again with that in mind. The term employer means a person engaged in industry affecting commerce who has 20 or more employees. The term also means any agent of such a person and a state or political subdivision. So the question is the numerosity provision, the 20 or more provision. Does that impact the state or political subdivision language or does it only impact the general definition of the term employer and the state or political subdivision language is an add-on, not a clarification of the language? And here the United States Supreme Court rules that the initial clause sets up a general definition of the term employer, but also provides some specific additional examples, namely any agent of such a person and also any state or political subdivision. In other words, the general rule does require 20 or more employees, but the more specific rule, which allows for state or subdivision, does not carry the more general limitation. And that's how the Supreme Court rules this. And I think this is correct and shows the importance of how language is constructed when you're thinking like a lawyer. Let us read a little bit more to determine how the Supreme Court came to that conclusion. They first note that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibited employment discrimination on the basis of race and other factors, applied initially solely to private sector employees and employers. And the same was true of the ADEA, enacted three years later to uh, protect workers from age discrimination. So initially, Congress, when it's passed this law, only contemplated private employers, not public employers, such as governments. In 1972, Congress amended Title VII to reach state and local employers. Under the revised provision of Title VII, the term person includes one or more individuals, government, government agencies, and political subdivisions. In Citizens United, the Supreme Court ruled that corporations were people, a decision that has been much decried. But you can see that the definition of people sometimes does not mean what you think it is. In this particular instance, Congress explicitly defined person to include governments, agencies, and political subdivisions. Not a normal meaning of the term person, but then again, Congress, when they're defining terms, can define them any way they like, and here they say that government agencies are, corp are people too. The Supreme Court notes here that the 1972 amendment to Title VII extends the statutory coverage to state and local governments by defining them as persons. And two years later, the Congress amended ADAA to also cover state and local governments. So they're showing a parallel construction and they're showing a parallel intention 
which shows that because Congress passed both sets of laws at roughly the same time, it's reasonable to read one in light of the other. The Supreme Court notes here in the 1974 enactment, Congress amended the Fair Labor Standards Act, on which parts of the ADA rely, to also reach government employees. So again, the Supreme Court's knowing that in a similar law, passed at a similar time, dealing with a similar purpose, Congress extended the reach to include government employees, again, showing a parallel construction and therefore a parallel intent. Here, the Supreme Court clarifies the question, does also means add new categories to the definition of employer, or does it merely clarify that states and their political subdivisions are a type of person included in the first sentence? If the former, state and local governments are covered by the EDA, regardless of whether they have 20 employees. If the latter, they are covered only if they have at least 20 employees, and federal courts have divided on the question. When federal courts divide, this is a standard basis for the U.S. Supreme Court granting jurisdiction to hear a case. It's not the only basis, but where there's a division in federal law, the Supreme Court is the only one who, that can resolve it, and it is a little awkward for different parts of the country to have different federal law, so that's one of the main roles of the Supreme Court is to unify federal law where there's a dis disagreement of opinion. Here the Supreme Court notes that grants certiorari to resolve the conflict and then goes on to say that for several reasons, we conclude that the words also means in section 630 add new categories of employers to the ADEA's reach. Indeed, raising also additively to create a new separate category of employer seemed to this court altogether fitting in EEOC versus Wyoming. Again, the Supreme Court is looking to parallel construction. Because the Supreme Court has interpreted this phrase to mean a particular thing in a particular context in a related case, because there's no major distinguishment here, it again makes sense to can read that consistently based on precedent. The Supreme Court goes on to say, in this regard, we note it is undisputed that the ADEA covers federal government entities, which in our opinion in Wyoming, grouped with state entities, regardless of the number of workers they employ again showing a consistent and parallel interpretation. The Supreme Court goes on to say, furthermore, the text of Section 630 pairs states and their political subdivisions with agents, a discrete category that, beyond doubt, carries no numerical limitation. So an agent is anyone who acts on behalf of a principal actor. So if you hire someone to do something on your behalf, they're an agent. And the Supreme Court notes here that agents do not have a numerical limitation, which wouldn't make sense. And since the, the government agencies are in the same breath, it makes no sense to imply to one versus the other, and I think that's correct. The Supreme Court says the fire district does not gainsay that the 20 employee restriction applies to Section 630's first sentence. A construction, however, would lift that restriction for the agent portion of the second sentence and then reimpose it to that portion of the sentence addressing states and their political subdivisions. We resist a reading so strange. I have to agree with the United States Supreme Court here. That is a pretty strange reading. You can't say one, two, and then say a preamble applies to two but not one. Under what universe does this make logically consistent or even grammatical sense? I think the Supreme Court is correct to read it that, in this way. If you're going to apply to one, you have to apply to the other. And it really makes no sense to say 20 agents or more, because that would be very weird. Normally, there's one agent. It's very weird to have multiple agents, although not unheard of. And having a numerical limitation there wouldn't make any sense. If it doesn't there, why would you apply here? Seems right to me. The fire district, however, presented policy arguments to argue against this interpretation. Here noting the fire district presents the argument that the ADEA should be interpreted in line with Title VII, which, as noted above, applies to state and local governments, only if they meet a numerosity specification. True reading the ADEA as written to apply to states and political subdivision, regardless of size, gives the ADEA, in this regard, a broader reach than Title VII. But this disparity is a consequence of different language Congress chose to employ. So in different provisions of law, Congress has different discriminatory provisions, and they don't always apply equally in all contexts. So it is a bit of an overreach to say that all employers are governed by the same anti-discrimination provisions. That's not necessarily true. Congress has, in some senses, made some provisions apply to some employers, not to others. Whether or not you think that's right or not is a little beside the point at the moment, because that is the law as Congress wrote it, and the Supreme Court is supposed to give interpretation to that fact. And there are potentially policy reasons why you would want to do that in some instances versus others. And, con and Congress is entitled to its choices, and the Supreme Court is giving entitlement to that fact. Continuing with this policy argument, the Fire District warns that applying the ADEA to small public entities risks curtailment of vital public services such as fire protection. Experience suggests otherwise, however, notes the court. For 30 years, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has consistently interpreted the ADEA as we do today, and a majority of states forbid age discrimination by its political subdivisions of any size. Some 15 of these states subject private sector employees to age discrimination proscriptions only if they employ at least a threshold number of workers. 
noting that the Congress's choice in saying that it should only apply if there's a certain minimum number of employees is not a, a weird choice, as several states have said that as well. Of course, some states have said it in their state discriminatory law that applies to employers regardless of size, but states get to make that choice as well. Finally, the Supreme Court notes that for the recent states, the judgment of the court of the appeals for Ninth Circuit is affirmed, again noting Justice Kavanaugh took no part of the discussion of this case. It, shows, it goes to show that words matter, and when you're reading statutes, you have to read them very, very carefully, like a lawyer, because words make choices, and when Congress puts certain words in certain places, the Supreme Court's going to interpret them, and different discrimination laws may not apply evenly, even if you think they should. But here, the Supreme Court notes that even though typically a minimum number of employees is required, 20 in this case, to be subject to the anti-discrimination provisions as it respects to age, that limitation does not apply to public employers. So although if you're a private business with 19 employees and you fire someone because of their age, uh, you're good as far as the feds are concerned. If you're a private employer or, or with more than 20 or a public employer with any number of employees, uh, not so much for you. It should be noted, however, in understanding this case, that age discrimination laws apply only if you are firing or discriminating against someone specifically and only because of age. The issue is not here that these people were unable to do their work. So although they were advanced in age, Mount Lemon did not make the argument that they fired them because they were unfit to do their work. If they were unfit to do their work, that would have been firement for cause, which would not be age discrimination related as far as the law is concerned. Age discrimination applies only if you're firing someone specifically and only because they are too old. So if they were fired for cause, this would be a different fact pattern. But Mount Lemon didn't make that argument. Mount Lemon made the argument that they fired these people just because they felt like it and they shouldn't be subject to any age discrimination rule because they were a public employer. But these people are capable of doing their work, at least as far as Mount Lemon is concerned, and because they fired the two most senior employees, age discrimination is fairly readily apparent, and the United States Supreme Court says that's wrong. If Mount Lemon wants to fire people because they can't do the job, that's a whole other issue and not raised by this case. So I think the distinction is important. Until later, my friends, that's all. Cheers. Goodbye.